person, and China was emitting 0.6, and India was emitting 0.32 ton per capita. Huh? And uh, what happens when we moved on? Well, you see the nice story of getting richer and getting healthier, and everyone did it at the cost of emission of carbon dioxide. There is no one who has done it so far. And we don't have the, all the updated data any longer because this is really hot data today. Huh? And there we are, 2001. And in the discussion I attended with global leaders, you know, many say, now, no, the problem is that the emerging economy, they are getting out too much carbon dioxide. The Minister of the Environment of India said, well, you are the one who caused the problem. The OECD countries, the high-income countries, they were the ones who caused the climate change. Eh? But we forgive you because you didn't know it, but from now on we count per capita. From now on we count per capita. And everyone is responsible for the capita emission. And this really shows you, we have not seen good economic and health progress anywhere in the world without uh, destroying the climate. And this is really what has to be changed. I've been criticized of showing a too positive <coughs> image of the world, but, but um, I don't think it's like this. The world is quite a messy place. This we can call Dollar Street. Everyone lives on this street here. What they earn here, what the number they live on is how much they earn per day. This family earns about one dollar per day. We drive up the street here, we find a family here which earns about two to three dollars a day. And we earn, drive away here, we find the first garden in the street, and they earn 10 to $50 a day. And how do they live? If we look at the bed here, we can see that they sleep on a rug on the floor. This is what poverty line is. 80% of the family income is just to cover the energy need, the food for the day. This is two to five dollars, you have a bed, and here it's a much nicer bedroom, you can see. I lectured this for IKEA, and they wanted to see the sofa immediately here. <laughs> uh, uh, and this is the sofa, how it will emerge from there. And the interesting thing, when you go around here in the photo panorama, you see the family still sitting on the floor there. And although there is a sofa, if you watch in the kitchen, you can see that the great difference for women does not come between one to ten dollars, it comes beyond here when you really can get good working condition in, in uh, the family. And if you really want to see the difference, you look at the toilet over here. This can change. This can change. These are all pictures and images from Africa, and it can become much better. We can get out of poverty. My own research has not been in ITU or anything like this. I spent 20 years in interviews with African farmers, which was on the verge of famine. And this is the result of the farmers' needs research. The nice thing here is that you can't see who are the researchers on this picture. That's when research function in poor societies. Yeah? You must really live with the people. Yeah? When you are in poverty, it's, everything is about survival. It's about having food. And these two young farmers, they are girls now, because the parents are dead in HIV and AIDS. They discuss with the trained agronomist. This is one of the best agronomists in Malawi, Jonathan Mikombira. Eh? And he's discussing about what sort of cassava they would plant, the best converter of sunshine to food that man has found. And they are very, very eagerly interested to get advice. That's to survive in poverty. That's one context. Getting out of poverty, the women told us one thing, get us technology. We hate this mortal to stand hours and hours. Get us a mill so that we can mill our flowers. Then we will be able to pay for the rest ourselves. Technology will bring you out of, 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 of poverty, but there's a need for a market to get away from poverty. And this woman is very happy now bringing her products to the market, but she's very thankful for the public investments in schooling so she can count and won't be cheated when she reaches the market. She wants her kid to be healthy, so she can go to the market and doesn't have to stay home. Huh? And she wants the infrastructure that's nice with a paved road. Huh? That's also good with credits. Microcredits gave her the, the bicycle, you know, and information will tell her when to go to market with which products. You, know. you can do this. I find my, my experience from 20 years of Africa is that the seemingly impossible is possible. Africa has not done bad. In 50 years, they've gone from pre-medieval situation to a very decent 100-year-ago Europe with a functioning national state. 
I would say that Sub-Saharan Africa have done best in the world during the last 50 years, because we don't consider where they came from. It's this stupid concept of developing countries, which put us Argentina and Mozambique together 50 years ago and said that Mozambique did worse. We have to know a little more about the world. I have a neighbor who knows 200 types of wine. He knows everything. He knows the name of the grape, the temperature, and everything. I only know two types of wine, red and white. <laughs> But my neighbor only know two types of countries, industrialized and developing, and I know 200. I know about the, the small data about the, the, you can do that. <laughs> but I have to get serious. And how do you get serious? You make a PowerPoint, you know? You make bullets. <laughs> Homage to the office package, no? Uh, what is this? What is this? What am I telling? I'm telling you that there are many dimensions of development. Everyone wants your pet thing. If you're in the corporate sector, you love microcredits. You know? If you're fighting in non-governmental organizations, you love equity between gender. Or if you're a teacher, you love UNESCO and so on. In global level, we just want our own thing. We need everything. All these things are important for development, especially when you just get out of poverty and you should go towards welfare. Now, what we need to think about is what is a goal for development and what are the means for development. Let me first grade what are the most important means. Economic growth to me, as a public health professor, is the most important thing for, uh, for development because it explains 80% of survival. Huh? Governance, to have a government that functions, that's what brought California out of the misery in 1850. It was the government which made law function finally. Huh? Education, human resources are important. Health is also important, but not that much as a mean. Eh? Environment is important. Human right is also important, but it just gets one cross. Now, what about goals? Where are we going toward? We're not interested in money. Money is not a goal. It's the best mean, but they give it zero as a goal. Eh? Governance, well, it's fun to vote and a little thing, but it's not so much. You know? It's not a goal. And go to school, I mean, it's not a goal. You know? It's a mean. Eh? Health, I give two points. I mean, it's nice to be healthy. At my age especially, you can stand here, you're healthy. That's good. It gives two plus. Environment is very, very crucial. There's nothing for the grandkid if you don't save it. But where are the important goals? It's, of course, it's human rights. Human rights is the goal, but it's not that strong of a mean for achieving development. And culture. Culture is the most important thing, I would say. Huh? Because that's what brings joy to life. That's the value of living. So the seemingly impossible is possible. Even African countries can achieve this. And I've, I've, I've shown you the shot that the seemingly impossible is possible. And, and, and remember, please remember my main message. That is this. The seemingly impossible is possible. We can have a good world. I showed you the shots. I proved it in the PowerPoint. And I think I will convince you also by... <laughs> Culture. <laughs> Bring me my sword. Sword swallowing is from ancient India. It's a cultural expression that for thousands of years has inspired human beings to think beyond the obvious. And I will now prove to you that the seemingly impossible is possible by taking this piece of steel, solid steel. This is the army bayonet from the Swedish army, 1850, in the last year we had war. You know? And it's all solid steel, you can hear here. Huh? And I'm going to... <laughs> to take this blade of steel and push it down through my body of blood and flesh and prove to you that the seemingly impossible is possible. Can I request a moment of absolute silence? 